Kennedy à l'Université McGill. I am Marion Dove. I am the chair of the Department of Family Medicine at McGill University, and I'm very, very happy to welcome you all today to the first webinar in a series that is being sponsored by the Department of Family Medicine and the School of Population and Global Health at McGill. So welcome to all the participants. We have a very good turnout. And the webinar series that we are inaugurating today um, is run by the Global Health Group at the Department of Family Medicine, which is run by Dr. Elaine Adams, Professor Elaine Adams, and also in conjunction, as I mentioned, with the School of Population and Global Health, whose director is one of our speakers today, Dr. Timothy Evans. The talk today is entitled Primary Health Care in the Context of Universal Health Systems, How to Walk the Talk. So we have two stellar speakers today who will be giving us short presentations, and then we will be opening up the uh, discussion. And what I would encourage you to do, please, is to write your questions in the chat and we will relay the questions to the speakers so that we can maximize the time that we hear the speakers talking. So please do make use of the chat to ask any questions as we're going along. This uh, series of webinars is, as I mentioned, being inaugurated today and will be running over the course of the first half of 2021. We have, for those of you who are not aware, a global pandemic going on right now, and there are a lot of health-related issues to be discussed. But if there were ever a time to be talking about the importance of universal health care and primary health care, this is the time. The pandemic has really brought out how important primary health care is for Canadians, um, actually for all citizens of the world. Health care is a right, and I think it's actually one of the defining characteristics of us as Canadians. And I'm saying that being mindful that right now, south of the border, there are some major changes going on. So we'll see what happens in the healthcare system down there. In, I'm going to just introduce our two speakers, and um, you will be uh, able then to start listening to them. So the uh, webinar series <coughs> um, is going to start off with Dr. Timothy Evans. Tim Evans has been at the forefront of advancing global health equity and strengthening health systems delivery for more than 20 years. His creative energies led to the Commission on the Social Determinants of Health, the development of numerous global partnerships, such as the Global Alliance on Vaccines and Immunization, the Global Financing Facility for Women, Children and Adolescents, and the creation of a novel hub and a spoke approach to training community midwives in Bangladesh. At McGill, he wears many hats. He is the inaugural director and associate dean of the School of Population and Global Health, SPGH, in the Faculty of Medicine. He is associate vice principal for global policy and innovation. He's executive director of Canada's COVID-19 Immunity Task Force. He's held multiple global leadership positions, including appointments as Senior Director of the Health, Nutrition and Population Global Practice at the World Bank Group, Dean of the James P. Grant School of Public Health at BRAC, University in Dhaka, Bangladesh, and Assistant Director General at the World Health Organization. Tim earned his DPhil in Agricultural Economics from the University of Oxford, where he was a Rhodes Scholar followed by medical and residency training at McMaster and Harvard Universities, respectively. Um, Dr. Danielle Martin is a family physician and associate professor in the Department of Family and Community Medicine and the Institute of Health Policy Management and Evaluation at the University of Toronto. She practices in the Family Practice Health Center at Women's College Hospital, where she is also the Vice President of Medical Affairs and Health System Solutions. Danielle's policy expertise and passion for equity have made her a leader in the debate over the future of Canada's healthcare system. She holds a Master's of Public Policy from the School of Public Policy and Governance at the University of Toronto. She has received many honors and awards. Her national best-selling book, Better Now, Six Big Ideas to Improve the Health of All Canadians, was released by Penguin Random House Canada in January of 2017. She was a lead author on a Lancet special report on Canadian healthcare. And I actually was at a faculty club 
uh, event a couple of years ago, all the years pre-COVID are sort of blurring together, where uh, Dr. Martin presented her new book, and that was a very, very well attended event, and I actually have a copy of the book. So that is my exciting connection to fame. So with that, I'm going to turn over the floor to Dr. Martin, who will start. And uh, in pre-webinar discussions, we said that her talk would be the dexamethasone talk, so the one to get us all pumped up. And then Dr. Evans' talk will be the trazodone talk to get us all to calm down afterwards. So here we go for getting pumped up with Dr. Danielle Martin. Thanks so much, Dr. Dove, and thank you for inviting me to be part of this uh, inaugural event. I'm thrilled to be here with Dr. Evans and all of you. And I want to uh, particularly acknowledge uh, one of my uh, lifelong mentors, uh, and uh, I, I consider myself to be the president of his fan club with us today is Dr. Morris McGregor, uh, former Dean of McGill, and I want to uh, particularly acknowledge and welcome him. Uh, so if people will bear with me for a moment, I'm going to share my screen. And we'll get going. Are we good? Can everyone see? Give me a thumbs up. Excellent. So, um, you know, because this is the first of a series of webinars, I think we have some latitude to uh, to determine how we want to spend our time. And I think both Tim and I would like to spend as much time as we can interacting with all of you. Um, and so I'm not going to make a, a long presentation, but I do think it's important to kind of uh, begin by setting some context, taking a step back, back and asking ourselves, you know, what is primary health care? Why do we care about it? What is its meaning? Um, and uh, what does it look like on the ground in the Canadian context as we work to try to improve it? And then we'll, we'll zoom out to the global perspective. And so I, I wanna begin by, by saying uh, that we talk a lot about evidence in academic circles, and I'm a fan of evidence. I think evidence is a very important input to public policy and an important uh, uh, stream of, uh, of, of knowledge that we bring to the conversations about how to structure our healthcare systems. But we are fooling ourselves if we think that evidence is the only input. And actually, I don't think that any of us would want to live in a world where evidence were the only input to the decisions we make about how we're going to spend our energy and our resources collectively. When we make decisions about how we structure our healthcare systems, we're also expressing our values. We're also adhering to concepts of feasibility, of resource uh, opportunity costs. We're talking about what is acceptable to the public uh, and we're engaging in an act of democracy. And so it's really important when we talk about healthcare uh, systems that we return back not only to evidence uh, as an input, but to a conversation about what, what are we in this for? What do we care about as a community and as a society? And then what are the best ways uh, that we can achieve those goals? And so when we talk about this, uh, this notion, for example, that Dr. Dove has raised about health as a human right, that raises as many critical questions as it answers. You know, what do we mean when we say that health is a right? And if we believe that, it, that there is a right to health, is that the same as a, as a right to health care, knowing what we know about the ways in which things outside of health care are much greater determinants of the, of the health of populations than health care itself? And if we believe that access to health care is a right, is universal health coverage the same thing as access to health care? And certainly, you know, the, the more layers of that onion you peel back, the more complex um, it becomes, which is what makes this work so meaningful and exciting. So let's take a tour then briefly of the choices that we've made in the Canadian healthcare systems uh, across our country and, uh, and what those choices mean. Now, I'll invite people to type into the chat if you can name, someone will get a prize if they can name the person on the left-hand side of this slide. Brianna, I can't see the chat and my slides, so I'm, I'm, bang, I'm counting on you to help me here. Yep. <laughs> We're going to monitor the chat box now. We have some answers coming in. Okay, can you read them out to me? Yeah, so we have Tommy Douglas, uh, Emmett Hall. Lots of Tommy Douglases. Lots of Tommy Douglases, excellent. Yes. So whoever, whoever uh, guessed Tommy Douglas first, send me an email and I will put a chocolate bar in the mail to you. That is indeed Tommy Douglas, and he uh, was voted in 2004 in the CBC uh, competition, the greatest Canadian of all time by the people of Canada. Um, you know, I, I, don't, I, I, don't, uh, I don't believe there was any election fraud in there at all. I think it was a true expression of what this person means uh, as, a, as a figure in Canadian history. 
And, uh, and, you know, Tommy, of course, the story of Tommy Douglas, well known to many Canadians. He was a young boy growing up on the, on the prairies of Canada, developed osteomyelitis, an infection of the bone of his leg. And uh, his parents were uh, subjected to a choice that we would think no family should ever be subjected to, which was having to choose between saving their son's leg and, uh, and losing uh, the farm, so to speak. And so many years later, uh, by the way, uh, his leg was eventually saved because he's, his parents agreed to have him uh, be a teaching case and be cared for by learners and trainees. So his, his story is also a story of medical education in Canada. But nevertheless, when he became the Social Democratic Premier of Saskatchewan, he brought into place the first single-payer uh, system in Canada for hospital and then physician services, a, a model that then spread across the country. So you would think to yourself, well, you know, Canada, we've got a public health care system. It's a symbol of our social values. It's uh, if you ask Canadians, 94% of them will say that our health care system is a symbol of what it means to be Canadian and a source of personal and collective pride. Um, and of course, we love to compare ourselves to the U.S. and how much uh, more fair our system is uh, than the system south of the border. But in fact, we don't have that public health care system in Canada. Our system is very complex, and I'm not going to walk you through the details of, of this, but I just wish to point out that actually we only really have a single payer publicly funded health care system in Canada for doctors and hospitals. And that's been the case really since the 1960s in Canada. And that's what we call uh, called in our in our little summary in the in the Lancet that uh, that Dr. Dove mentioned, layer one of, of services in Canada. This is the layer that we think about. And as uh, my colleague PG Forrest likes to say, this is the social contract of Canada. If I get sick, I can go to a doctor. If I get really sick, I can go to a hospital. And that is laudable and important. And it is indeed um, uh, something that Canadians rally around. But in fact, beyond that, it's a lot more spotty, isn't it? When you go to layer two, when we're talking about coverage for prescription drugs, home care, long-term care, or mental health services, <clears throat> as we see the ripple effects of this pandemic on the mental health of Canadians, and we know that the overwhelming majority of people have virtually no coverage for mental health services provided um, outside of a psychiatrist or in a mental health uh, institution, we're, we're headed for real trouble. And then in layer three, services, I mean, at what point did we decide that the mouth is not part of the body? And yet, we do not offer uh, really almost any publicly funded dental care services in Canada, vision care, etc. And so we have a hodgepodge of, uh, of systems in Canada, uh, a, a whole bunch of ways in which we uh, talk about the financing and delivery of healthcare services. And primary care the provision of essential services in the community, such as well baby visits, such as uh, preventive maneuvers in, in the form of uh, pap smears, blood pressure checks, management of chronic disease, such as diabetes by physicians, nurses, nurse practitioners, and other healthcare providers, tends to fall into layer one. But primary health care, which is a much more integrated view about how we can take care of people uh, through health and social services um, straddles all three of these layers. So what it is uh, primary care, primary health care, I'm not going to get into to detailed definitions, but I do want a, a, a nod to the evidence, the reason why we talk about primary care and primary health care uh, in health services design is because the evidence is extremely strong that when you build a health care system on a solid foundation of primary care or primary health care, you, pr you produce a system that is more cost effective, more equitable, and delivers higher quality care. And you know, a lot of this work, uh, which was um, began with uh, giants like the late Bar doc Dr. Barbara Starfield and has continued through the research of many uh, others through the generations, uh, these studies are very clear. And yet when we look, and I'm sure Tim may, may or may not want to speak to this in his remarks, when we look at countries that are, uh, uh, in a financial position to be able to build health services for their citizens, uh, but who don't yet have much of an infrastructure to build upon, it is very tempting to build big fancy hospitals with machines that go ping and imaging uh, that can you know see through uh, through your uh, your your uh, your various body parts and surgeries that can reattach your pancreas to your earlobe. It is not necessarily seen as sexy 
to invest in community health care workers on the ground who can provide essential primary care services. But actually, if you begin from the beginning by putting in place those services that are close to home, you, 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 struck, you can construct a much, much better system that works better uh, for everyone and that is a better use of dollars. So when I think about primary care, I talk about three crucial relationships and I'd ask you to each imagine uh, your own experiences with your family physician or nurse practitioner, the person who at some time in your life has been your, your first point of contact for care in the healthcare system. And think about uh, what's worked and what hasn't in that relationship. I think about it in three layers. The first is the one that we often talk to, talk to our residents about when we're training people to become family physicians is the provider-patient relationship. That is a, a longitudinal, continuous relationship. As Dr. Ian McQuinney uh, once said, it, it is the, the instance in which you know the patient before you know what their disease will be. And you walk with that person through the terrain of their life alongside them, sometimes able to do something about it, sometimes not able to do something about it, but you accompany them through that rocky terrain of illness and disease and health over the course of their, of their experience of living. That's a critical relationship and it's one that we spend a lot of time on. The next level of relationship is a little bit less well explored in the Canadian system. And this is what I call the relationship between the practice and the system. This is about primary care providers being able to get timely and appropriate access to resources for their patients, whether those are social services, whether it's specialty services, and I'm gonna give you some examples. And then the final one is true population health management in which we use technology, our understanding of the communities in which we live, uh, to structure uh, primary health care services that are truly proactive in producing health uh, in our neighborhoods. Well, where are we at? You know, uh, most Canadians report that they have a regular person that they go to see. And that's a start. You know, I think it's somewhere around 85% uh, uh, or so of Canadians say, I have someone who I consider to be my primary care provider. And this is the supplementary mandate letter that Justin Trudeau, Prime Minister Justin Trudeau, just sent to Health Minister of Health, Patty Haidu, uh, five days ago, in which once again, um, he, uh, he uh, emphasized the critical importance of every Canadian having access to a primary care provider. So we're still trying to chase that holy grail of connecting people to primary care. But remember we talked about, is access to universal health coverage or even having a person you can point to as your primary provider the same thing as having access to healthcare services? And we know that in Canada, we lag behind in many areas. Most people don't report that they can see their uh, primary care provider same day or next day. Most people don't report that they can uh, um, feel a coordination of health and social services between their family physician um, and other, uh, other providers in the community. So we're a long way from the holy grail of, tr of truly integrated primary health care, even here in the land of Tommy Douglas. I wanna close uh, by offering a few examples of where I think we're headed because I'm a future oriented and uh, an optimistic person. And I believe that we're, we're doing tremendous work all over this country that we can be proud of. And I, I'm gonna zoom in on the place where I work, Women's College Hospital, which is an unusual place. It's a hospital that has no emergency department and no inpatient beds. So try to picture a hospital in which actually we are trying to, to orient the entirety of our hospital services to serve primary care. And that is uh, um, uh, what we're trying to achieve through the, what, we, what we call Canada's first virtual hospital. So um, we talk about in-person care in this small bubble at the bottom here as being the foundation. Health healthcare is fundamentally a human enterprise. We will always provide in-person care. But where we get um, uh, uh, more interesting is in these subsequent bubbles. Care at a distance has suddenly exploded in Canada. Uh, the notion of virtual visits, video visits, even telephone visits between providers and patients um, has suddenly got, you know, overnight become a business as usual here. Um, and, but where we really get into a system that can support primary care provision is in the next bubble out. That's what we call connected expertise. Imagine a system in which the hospital and the specialist view their primary concern 
as serving the primary care providers in their neighborhood and community. We are putting in place a whole suite of programs in which uh, fam family physicians can pick up the phone and talk to a specialist to get immediate advice, uh, e-consultation to get an email response within 48 hours, and a whole suite of services to say, you are the person who knows the patient best, rather than pulling that person in to drive to my hospital, park in the basement for 24 bucks, sit in the waiting room for 45 minutes for six minutes of FaceTime with a specialist, let us bring the specialist to the primary care provider um, through that form of backup. And then finally, where primary health care would take us is to truly enhanced access in which we're providing uh, social services and uh, at-home supports for people to manage their own um, experiences of illness. So really uh, understanding that when the future is chronic disease management, people are not most of the time in contact with a healthcare provider. They are managing themselves. And our job is to provide, provide them with tools to be able to most effectively do that. So that's, I believe, what the future of healthcare looks like in this country, um, and it's the journey that we're on. Uh, and so I'll, be, I'll end by saying, I think the big question for all of us, those of us who care about health and who care about equity and social justice is to ask ourselves, if we really believe that our healthcare systems serve as public expressions of what it is that we value as a community, then what does it look like to build a system that we're proud of? And primary care, primary health care are a critical component of that, but they're not going to be the only thing. We're going to have to ask ourselves very difficult questions about uh, social services, about social determinants of health, um, about economic justice. Um, and if there's anything that the pandemic is doing, it's uh, widening those cracks that pre-existed in our social fabrics, uh, many of which contribute quite directly to health. Thank you. I will try to thank you. Here. Thank you very much, Dr. Martin. I do feel like that was a little shot of dexamethasone for me anyway. Um, lots of what you said is music to my ears. Um, specialists serving primary health care providers. This is like just sounds so excellent. Um, but before I start going off on my tangents, we would we will turn the floor over to Dr. Timothy Evans, who is going to uh, talk to us for the second presentation of this webinar and please everybody do uh, note your questions as the speakers are talking and put them into the chat because we will be taking them up uh, at the end of Dr. Evans intervention. So over to you, uh, Tim, for the trazodone portion of this talk. Great. Uh, thanks very much, Marion. And thanks, Danielle, for getting us off to a great start. Uh, you've made uh, my life a lot easier, as you'll, you'll, you'll see. I'm going to provide a slightly more global perspective, but uh, global is inclusive of Canada, um, not only because Canada is one of 194 member states in the United Nations, but also because uh, there is almost every uh, member state uh, represented in the Canadian population uh, increasingly. So uh, uh, that uh, relates to the, the wonderful mosaic of Canada. Um, I'm going to begin with universal health coverage and, and talk about the challenge, in part because it's a, a global United Nations uh, sustainable development goal, uh, but uh, then look at uh, its intersection with um, uh, primary health care uh, and, and talk about valuing health and, and, and just uh, provide a few thoughts on the, the critical need for systems innovation uh, because I think that's the way we uh, can make good on our values. Um, so this is universal health coverage. Uh, the target by 2030 is to, uh, for the world is to achieve it and this was uh, member states uh, putting their objectives first in these uh, sustainable development goals in 2015. And the dimensions are really uh, to make sure you've got uh, the full population covered uh, uh, with quality services and without uh, financial imposition. Uh, and, and so those are the, the, the uh, what's become termed the uh, WHO box or cube. Uh, and uh, when we look at how well we're doing, uh, there's still a long way to go. Uh, about 50% of people globally lack access to basic care. And every year, because of the way health is financed, about 100 million people are impoverished, i.e. they're put tipped into poverty. 
and that has a huge regressive effect on health systems. This is what it looks like in places. So uh, in, in the context of urban, rapid urban growth, you literally have populations living on the other side of the train tracks, on the other side of the track, and, and these are the challenges um, that are the front lines um, in urban areas in many places or in rural remote areas. And uh, this is the village in uh, southern Guinea where the first case of Ebola uh, took place in December 2013. Uh, no healthcare facility, uh, no contact with the healthcare system, and it wasn't until three months later uh, that the epidemic was discovered, at which point it was disseminated uh, widely in three countries of West Africa and became uh, a, uh, a pandemic uh, uh, that uh, uh, crisis um, for uh, the world uh, in 2014 and 15. Um, in the context of our current pandemic, uh, for which we were not prepared uh, and which we're all suffering, um, uh, it's not only that we're suffering the pandemic, uh, it's that a lot of the, pr the primary care services have been uh, diverted. And uh, this goalkeepers report issued by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation in September of 2020 indicated uh, that uh, there had been huge loss of progress, as much as 25 years of progress in just 25 weeks, uh, secondary to uh, the impact of the pandemic. Um, of course, uh, the challenges of the front lines are not limited to low-income settings. And uh, as we have struggled, especially in our most, uh, in our most populous and richest pop, uh, provinces uh, of Ontario and Quebec um, and the United States with uh, the most expenditure per capita in the world on health, uh, really just figuring out how to test at scale in order to get on top of the pandemic has really been beyond uh, the capacity of our testing systems. And so uh, this is an expression of frontline, but it pays attention to public health uh, as a critical dimension of this. It's not just health care. And I think population health has to be much more fundamentally integrated into this. So this is, uh, um, uh, a former Canadian Prime Minister, I'm sure all of you recognize him, um, actually not yeah, UK, sorry, uh, but never let a good crisis go to waste. Um, and so uh, what do we do? We begin by valuing health. And this, uh, uh, Danielle brought up very clearly, but this is absolutely fundamental. Uh, the World Health Organization has a constitution that talks about the right to health. And in it, is not only that everybody should have in the enjoyment of the highest uh, attainable standard of health as a fundamental right, but it be uh, a right without distinction. And this is particularly important in this day and age of race, religion, political beliefs, economic or social condition. So this is a fundamental um, uh, document that around which uh, the world rallies and respects uh, Canadian the first director general of WHO, Brock Chisholm, uh, was one of the architects uh, of this constitution. So um, uh, it has huge relevance. Uh, anybody who can guess who the person is in the picture on the left there in the middle uh, gets another chocolate bar from Danielle. Uh, so uh, this is the story she told. I won't take time, take time on it, but just to say, I have to remind all my colleagues internationally that Canada only got single payer system uh, in, uh, in the mid 60s. Um, and it was thanks to uh, a politician, uh, not a doctor. And in fact, the doctors were not terribly supportive of what was called Medicare. Uh, but this was that expression of values, of rights, and that ill health should not be the basis for economic demise. And uh, this is uh, something that uh, led to this, uh, the Alma-Ata Declaration of 1978. Now, um, here you have Holfdan Mahler on the, on, on the, in the middle, and he was the Director General of WHO at that point. Uh, and Holfdan um, uh, was really the architect 
of the Alma-Ata Declaration on, on Primary Health Care, but he uh, had it as a two-stage process, which was values-based, health for all being the symphony, and primary health care being the score, the technical prescription. And so uh, this uh, was something that took place in the midst of the Cold War. And you can see that uh, somebody on the left there, and that's a chocolate bar question, uh, who might that be? Um, I don't think it's Justin Trudeau, but, um, or his father. Uh, but if somebody gets the right answer on that, uh, there should be some right answers on that. What does the chat say? Uh, we had lots of answers coming in about Kennedy. I think it not. I think Ted Kennedy, Jeannie, has got it. Uh, so well done. Chocolate bar for you. Um, but I, I mentioned that because uh, this was seen as a, a socialist medicine uh, by the West uh, and not really accepted in the context of the Cold War, although it did provide this overarching uh, vision for uh, health. And I'm trying to scroll. Ah. So um, uh, in an effort to try and continue to value health, um, uh, uh, we've, uh, when I was at the World Bank, we developed the whole idea of human capital. And this was uh, the recognition that instrumentally, uh, if you wanted economies to develop and prosper, you had to invest in the health of their people. Um, and uh, as well as their education. And the World Development Report made that very clear. Bill Gates picked up on that development report and donated uh, together as, with his spouse uh, billions towards uh, global health. And uh, a very important dimension of this uh, uh, economic argument on the importance of health is that uh, as a growing sector, it's one of the most vital and virtual, virtuous employers. Uh, and this recognizes the fact that uh, the majority of, of, uh, of uh, health workers are women and when they're on the front lines, as they were in the context of Ebola, uh, they uh, are acknowledged in terms of the value uh, they bring uh, to uh, societies everywhere. So universal health coverage uh, was really seen as an engine for health and for human capital creation. And this has been part of what's uh, uh, tried to drive greater valuation of health. Um, at Alma-Ata, uh, there's been now 40 years, 42 years, 43 years since uh, the declaration um, and uh, efforts to renew it. And, 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 I, and, I, and I think uh, in that context, um, it's really important to understand that uh, the, the renewal is both political and technical. And, and uh, I, that uh, leads me then into thinking then, well, if, we're, if our values are in that direction to make, every, make sure everybody has uh, access to care on the front lines, what are some of the things that we need to think about um, much more systematically? And the first is that, that healthcare systems are incredibly complex. Uh, and this is me when I worked at WHO and had a little more hair. I would push uh, a, a problem uh, to the left uh, with a hope that I would solve it. And of course, uh, the system has an unintended consequence, often that we're not aware of. Um, so when you look at systems performance across uh, and from a global perspective, you see uh, in a, uh, all sorts of performance shortfalls, uh, financing insufficiency leading to insolvency, massive inefficiency in the existence of resources, in the use of resources, and uh, un intolerable inequities in terms of access uh, to care. Um, moreover, it was Julian Tudor Hart in 1971 who really um, uh, pointed to the unintended consequence of complex systems in the context of UK, the UK NHS uh, and noted that the availability of good medical care tends to vary inversely with the need for it in the population. So this regressive nature of healthcare services, even in settings where they're supposed to be progressive, uh, is something we need to maintain. So a few thoughts on financing. Um, 
beyond the three Bs for financing health, if we look from a global perspective, um, um, the primary form of financing is paying when you're ill. And that's what I call the Benjamins. Uh, they're in the middle of the stethoscope. Most regressive, uh, creates massive impoverishment and doesn't provide an opportunity to organize the system to perform. Um, unfortunately, that remains the majority uh, form of financing in the world. The two other Bs, Bismarck uh, is the social health insurance system and beverage, the tax-based system, which the Canadian system looks a little bit more like. Those have been around now for um, uh, the Bismarck system over a, a well over a century and beverage coming up on 70 years. And the issue with both of those systems is that the conditions in low and middle income countries don't lend themselves to those types of financing systems. Social health insurance, people get coverage through employers. Most people in low middle income countries do not have formal employers. They don't get paychecks. And in the uh, tax based system, uh, the tax revenue generation capacity of most governments in low middle income countries remains very slow and grows at, at, at very low and, and grows very slowly. So thinking unrealistically that you can just say, well, let's have a tax-based system or let's have an employer-based insurance system uh, is not necessarily a realistic solution. And on the basis of that, we need to be thinking much more creatively about what are possible financing systems. But it's not simply in terms of uh, thinking about how to ensure uh, access to care. It's looking at how to finance core functions of public health for preparedness, um, how to curb behavior through uh, uh, what might be called win-win-win taxes on tobacco and public health ads, and also how to finance those other sectors that are critical to the creation of good health opportunity. So those are just a few thoughts on financing. In terms of service coverage, uh, we're into the, the global vaccine campaign and uh, disappointing news this week in Canada. Um, uh, but it uh, uh, will face, and perhaps increasingly, issues related to whether the public uh, and publics are uh, going to take these up. Uh, and this relates, again, to this issue of managing delivery in front time. Uh, front, um, front in the front lines. Uh, here's a picture of Pfizer's delivery system uh, in India. A friend sent this to me, a little bit tongue in cheek. Uh, but the reality is that many low and middle income countries uh, exercise their mass vaccination efforts uh, on, a, on a much more regular basis than uh, the Canadian uh, and uh, high income country settings. So there may be uh, things to learn. Um, but one of the things on services is that we are increasingly faced by technological innovation, which does not come primarily from the health sector. And here are just three pictures, a drone in Rwanda, uh, 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 delivering a payload of blood at a district hospital uh, for a woman who has just delivered and has postpartum hemorrhage, uh, a system uh, that uh, has entirely changed the delivery system uh, uh, for uh, essential life-saving products in that country. Uh, in the middle, we have the move now to uh, uh, home-based care uh, through uh, smartphones, which is, uh, has tremendous potential to disrupt in a, in a positive, but also uh, potentially not so positive way. And the third is the, the era of robots, uh, which uh, is again uh, uh, helping to uh, create efficiencies and uh, access and connection with the system, uh, both uh, with opportunities and some risks. Um, finally, we need to look in the context of service delivery at uh, trends which surprise us. Uh, and here uh, in uh, what Henry Kissinger uh, did, called uh, Bangladesh in 1971, the basket case of the world that would never improve, uh, over uh, uh, the period 1993 to 2007, uh, we saw, uh, we observed massive improvements in equity and in, in, in coverage and in equity, equitable coverage of vaccination. So in some respects, uh, Bangladesh was breaking Tudor Hart's inverse care law. And when you observe this over time, you have to ask yourself, well, what generated 
that uh, better than expected performance. And there's a tremendous amount that can be learned from the front lines when one investigates that. And innovation does not necessarily need to be top down. In fact, uh, if it's bottom up, it may be much more sustainable and successful. Lastly, um, health workers uh, lead the way. Um, unfortunately, at, at we're overlooking uh, the numbers, quality types, and the conditions in which they work, uh, which is making it much more difficult to tap that critical resource. Uh, fortunately, uh, there's renewed interest in uh, community health workers, and uh, here an NGO in the United States called Last Mile Health has developed a global community health work curriculum and, and this is really trying to standardize and systematize training uh, so that community health workers are not ad hoc solutions, but actually become much Im more important foundations of the health system. Workers that make changes in the system are not necessarily health professionals. And if anybody gets these two uh, uh, characters, uh, those are two chocolate bars each. Um, uh, one uh, here on the left, both of these uh, have been uh, uh, pioneers in investing in women's development uh, and really placing trust uh, in, in hand, empowering women and their economic uh, and social livelihoods. And through that, uh, they, uh, their efforts are part of what explains uh, the breaking of inverse care uh, in uh, Bangladesh. Uh, the, uh, uh, on the left, you have Muhammad Yunus, and on the right, Sir Fazal Abed. Uh, tremendous entrepreneurs, um, social entrepreneurs uh, that have uh, blazed important paths globally. I'm going to finish by just asking a provocative question, and, and this relates to my role as, a, as a, in, in, and I think Marion's academic leadership roles, all of our academic leadership roles, but are we transforming education to strengthen health systems to achieve their values, i.e. universalism and quality uh, uh, provision of services and good care in an independent, interdependent world. And this commission uh, in 2010 uh, set that out as the vision for health professionals in the new century and, and identified here uh, some of the uh, types of learning that are particularly important on that front uh, informative, formative, and transformative. And my sense 10 years on from this commission report is uh, we need to rethink whether we're not, uh, whether we're doing enough on that front uh, so that we have the agents, the change agents of innovation that are actually going to allow us to achieve our values that are reflected in the word primary health care. So these are the expectations uh, where you have universalism and convergence everywhere. Young children uh, through media uh, are all looking and depending on uh, health professionals who see it as their role to make sure that they have every health opportunity uh, that we have um, uh, globally. So I'll stop there, thanks. Thank you very much, Dr. Evans. Um, I want to point out that there was a respondent to uh, called Nikita who got one of the answers to your um, query about who the men were in the one of the latter slides so maybe he should get a chocolate bar also um, and I want to tell you that your talk was actually <clears throat> much more of a dexamethasone type talk than a trazodone talk so I'm afraid you didn't quite succeed in your trazodone mission but uh, you really got us all pumped up and there are in fact a few questions in the chat so I'm going to um, read out the first one um, and I will actually ask we have quite a few questions so maybe each of you can answer just uh, briefly so that we have a chance to get through uh, the questions because we have only about 15 minutes left so the first question is, primary health care takes into account health promotion and prevention. So how is this virtual system taking into consideration health education activities for those who need it? So maybe we can start okay. with uh, Danielle and then go to Tim. Thanks. I think uh, so, uh, you know, the, the model that I presented is not a model for health systems. Uh, 
uh, writ large, it's a, it's a model of hospital care. And so, you know, I want to um, situate and acknowledge that it's, uh, it's not intended to be all things to all people. It is about how does one take the resources available in a hospital and distribute them as equitably as possible in service of population health goals. Uh, what I will say, though, is that I think that there is, there is tremendous potential for technology uh, to be a supportive um, enabler of true population health approaches. I mean, the, the capacity that we have now to use data to make decisions about how to distribute our resources is um, truly extraordinary. And I think that we, you know, in the, if you think about the notion of the learning health system, the ways in which we can use the data that come out of local electronic health records uh, as, as basic as those uh, uh, systems might be, and use them alongside big data to drive um, uh, the models of, of service delivery on the ground. Like these are very practical, real ways uh, to improve uh, and to, to combat, if you will, the inverse care law, uh, as Tim was saying. So I think that there's, uh, there's tremendous potential there. Um, of course, it has to be used for the forces of good. Tim, do you have something you want to add to that? Uh, very briefly, response? I think it's a great question. But uh, I sit on a on a panel um, with the National Academies of Medicine in the United States, which is looking at uh, how new virtual technologies are, are going to be deployed. One of the big issues in terms of uh, making sure that you've got uh, uh, access according to need relates to the way in which um, those virtual interfaces are being financed. And I don't, I'm an economist, so I don't wanna make uh, everything sound like it relates to money, but these do become important things in fee-for-service systems. Uh, and people's time and energy is a function of what they can bill for or what they cannot bill for. And I think there's gonna be an increasing interface and in understanding um, uh, how these services that are delivered virtually uh, can be done in such a way that they satisfy needs, first and foremost, and two, are not insensitive uh, or um, uh, going to create backlashes with respect to expectations on um, remuneration for those that are involved in providing those services. Great. Thank you. Um, the next question is whether we really have been underspending on public health and whether the data supports that. So maybe again, we'll go first to Danielle and then to Tim. I'll defer to Tim on that one. Uh, yes. And uh, uh, if you look um, at PHAC, the Public Health Agency of Canada, um, you'll see that it has been systematically underfunded um, against its core um, um, uh, functions. Um, and there's been a fair amount of media uh, uh, with respect to some of them in particular. But more generally, uh, there, there is much less political appetite to pay for services or outcomes that you can't see the benefit of. Right? So if you prevent measles or you prevent polio, uh, nobody understands really what the value of that is if they never see the problem. Uh, and so this issue of paying for prevention is one of these conundrums because if you eliminate disease, it has infinite benefits. But for the generation which has never seen the disease, uh, it's much more important for them in terms of their immediate needs to be able to go and get care uh, when they have a cough or they're feeling ill. So this is a conundrum in financing and, and it requires particular attention. Uh, and what we're seeing with underfinanced um, public health agencies is they only have one speed when it comes to an, a pandemic and that's slow. And in fact, what they have to be able to do is surge. And there's virtually no capacity for that in the system at the moment, in part because we're neglecting to think actively about how to finance it so it can perform those functions. Thank you, Tim. Uh, the next question is for you, Danielle. What 
are some strategies that are being taken up at Women's College Hospital to address pertinent barriers that impede mHealth and telehealth adoption for vulnerable patients, such as undocumented, low income, or migrants? It's a great question and a critically important one that we spend a lot of time on um, in my organization. So I'm gonna answer the question two ways. The first is to uh, respectfully question the premise um, because actually uh, one thing that we know is that it is, an inc it is incredibly hard for someone who is from an equity seeking group, someone who's a migrant worker, someone who's working a, a, a precarious low wage job to take a half a day off of work to go into a traditional healthcare system for a face-to-face -face visit. Um, and so actually, when well constructed with, uh, with underserved groups in mind, um, there, is, uh, there is very interesting evidence to suggest, and including ac actually from the global health world, that M health and telehealth can be uh, really good ways for people who um, can't access traditional healthcare services to do so. Um, of course, these things always have limits and you've got to design it right. But, uh, you, you know, we did a very interesting uh, uh, study here that I was engaged with around uh, taxi drivers in the city of Toronto. So cab drivers, who drives a cab in the city of Toronto? Overwhelmingly, it's South Asian men in sedentary jobs. They're self-employed, uh, so they have no prescription drug coverage, high rates of diabetes, hypertension, um, and other things that they're, uh, that they're predisposed to. And then um, incredible stress um, in the job, as well as um, you know, uh, lots of issues around low back pain or whatever. Not so easy to take time off to go and see your family doctor for any of those things. But you know what every taxi driver has in this day and age is a phone. And so actually there are very interesting ways that you can um, leverage that um, in order to think about, but you've got to go and talk to people and you've got to ask them what works for them. And you've got to design your services alongside them in ways that are actually going um, to work. So that's the first thing. But the second thing is that it's critically important. And this links to the, the uh, comment that Tim made about fee for service. When you design virtual care services that sit outside of the rest of health systems, um, then you're, all you're really doing is layering in more stuff. And uh, I question whether any of the more stuff approach ever really does very much for health. When you integrate those services in, when the, when the virtual visit is not with a random virtual login clinic, but with your own family doctor, or your own specialist, you saw them, you met them once in person, and then the follow-up is by phone in the evening at a time that's convenient for you. Um, when you can say, well, this person doesn't have access to a phone or doesn't have access to a, a computer or a tablet, we're gonna um, get the people who do have access to a computer or a tablet to do their visits that way and save the in-person care for the person who really needs it the most. Then you're sliding back and forth along those bubbles in that diagram I showed you with a view to equity. And that's how you really can uh, leverage IT. So you can, you can do it by designing the services in ways that will meet the needs of underserved groups, but you can also do it by designing services that will meet overserved or adequately served groups and make space and hold that space in the in-person system for the people who mm. need it the most. Thank you for that very interesting response. The next question is for both of you um, from a graduate student. What are your recommendations for doctoral and master's students that seek to positively impact health systems and still graduate sane and within a reasonable period of time? So neither of you is dying <laughs> to answer it, that Tim. question. <laughs> yeah, so I, I think there's, there's a problem with the question is uh, there's a, a sense that somehow you stop being a student once you graduate. Um, you're a student for life. Um, uh, my suggestion would be uh, um, uh, twofold. Uh, one, don't be a lemming. Uh, don't do what everybody else is doing, where the crowds are going. Uh, ident identify an issue that you care passionately about or uh, that has been brought to your attention. Uh, and, and then focus on that issue uh, in a way that uh, is really going to um, help solve the problem that you're looking at. 
and do not in any way be concerned about trespassing any dis disciplinary boundaries in looking at rallying the intellectual and technical and analytic uh, support you need to uh, really uh, generate valuable insights on that. Uh, and don't be in too much of a hurry. Uh, you'll get there. It took me, I think, about 16 years to get my uh, graduate degree, but uh, I'm sure you'll do it much faster. Thank you. That's a, that's a great answer. Um, and I think we have time for one more question. And so the question is about the curriculum for community health workers. Um, and I think it's addressed to Tim. Did you have a look at the curriculum for CHRs in Indigenous communities in Canada and how we might integrate it into practice in ways that are meaningful to the communities being served? I, the short answer is no, uh, but I, again, I think uh, it's a great opportunity and I'd love to pursue it. It's a uh, Viv, I, I think is the name, Viv for um, And, and I, the reason that I, I like the question is that, um, you know, that we can think about opportunities for uh, training frontline workers in a global world where we share lessons across borders much more seamlessly. And I think the opportunities for learning there are, are boundless. Uh, and so making those connections, especially in the virtual world, and then understanding uh, places where there's differences and, and similarities or new uh, uh, innovative ways of doing things, it's just uh, uh, a great opportunity at this time. So uh, we, should, we should move that forward. And I'll, I'm happy to put uh, Viv in touch with Last Mile Health. In fact, Last Mile Health is going to be coming and presenting here um, at, a, at a, I think, at the next seminar. A subsequent webinar. That is great news. So everybody stay tuned and look for the Department of Family Medicine newsletter and any publications from the School of Population and Global Health for those dates that will be coming up. I want to, um, in the last two minutes, ask Danielle a final question about the relationship between the family doctor and the patient that you pointed out was one of the key foundational relationships in the healthcare system, but it seems that this is lost on policymakers who basically think if a patient can get an appointment with any doctor anywhere, that's basically what we should be measuring. And how can we as family physicians advocate for the continuity of care, the importance of continuity of care in the healthcare system? You know, this is where I believe uh, so strongly in the power of uh, uh, communicating to the public uh, rather than aiming our communications at politicians. I have to say, you know, you mentioned earlier that I had this experience of writing a book. You know, I traveled all over Canada back uh, in, the, in the days when one could do such things. Um, mostly in the freezing cold, right? There it is. Um, and, you know, the, the, what, the idea that I worried, I had this, these six big ideas to improve healthcare. And the one that I worried the most about was uh, one called uh, the return to relationships, which, and, which is about relationship-based primary care for every Canadian. And every time I would go to give a talk in the Roxy Theater at Saskatoon or uh, the public library in Halifax, I would think to myself, you know, people are just going to think I'm a mushy, you know, uh, bleeding heart. And, uh, and actually, this was the idea that everybody got immediately. Canadians get it. They all know what it's like to be cared for by a person who knows them, who sees them as a whole person, who is holistic in their approach, uh, who knows uh, their life's history. And those who don't have it feel its absence. And so I think that actually, we don't need to communicate to politicians. We can um, ask our patients and our communities, our citizens to stand up for this premise and this principle in healthcare. It was actually very moving to me to see how immediately people related to that, uh, to that big idea. Thank you. That is a wonderfully inspiring note on which to end, that we should be using our population, our patients, the general Canadian, uh, the average Canadian as our big ally in this uh, battle to improve our healthcare system. So I want to thank you both very, very much on behalf of the Department of Family Medicine um, and also Adams who organized this to thank Yasmin Elmir, our communications manager who has worked so well to set this all up. 
there is a global health workshop series starting next week the 27th of january there will be future webinars so keep your eyes out